I get opportunities because I have a reputation for saying yes. I have a reputation for risking. I have a reputation for adventure. And because of that, it creates more opportunities and more wonder in life. Overthinking is always negative scenarios. So immediately move into a positive scenario. But unfortunately, that won't solve the problem, but it will at least stop the downward cycle of negative thinking. The only thing that stops overthinking is action. Hey guys, my name is Aaron McManus and you're listening to the MindShift Podcast. I just want to say thank you to every single person who listens each and every week. We drop episodes on Fridays. We've been doing this for a few years now and we are so grateful for every person who subscribes to the YouTube, who's rate and reviewed us on Spotify and Apple Music, wherever you watch podcasts. Thank you so, so much. I'm excited to introduce this next episode because it's something a little bit unique and a little bit different. As we're getting ready to launch Easter at Mosaic, we decided to pull an episode, a conversation, that we had recently in the arena community calls. This is something we've never shared before, something that we keep really private and usually you only get access if you join the arena. So this is my little commercial. We don't do ads on this podcast, but we do talk about the projects that we're building. And the arena is something that I truly believe is for every single person who's interested in leveling up their communication, leadership, or character. The arena is a phenomenal online learning community where you get access to all of our masterclass information a weekly call with my dad, Earl McManus, and I, and the monthly summits with different speakers who come to our conference each year. We've had people like Ali Webb, the founder of Drybar, Jerry Lorenzo, the founder of Fear of God. We have Brandon Bouchard coming in October. We have Donald Miller. We have Will Goodara. We have so many amazing voices that have chosen to invest into the arena and the community that we are building over here. We want to invite you. We want you to be a part of it. But for the moment, I want you to just buckle up or shower or roll over in bed or turn on the YouTube. However you're listening to us, we want you guys to enjoy this episode of the arena called Overthinking. And halfway into this thing, we will kind of break it open into a Q&A with our online community. And this is kind of the way that the arena works. It, it's like 30 minutes of a conversation and then 30 minutes of engagement and Q&As. But I want you guys to get a little sneak peek. I also think I am someone who overthinks all of the time. I think a lot of us overthink consistently and we got to get out of our heads. So get into this episode, enjoy it, and you'll see me back at the end. Hey guys, it's good to see you. Um, I'm here in uh, Chinatown <laughs> and, uh, in uh, New York. And yeah, it was pretty crazy. On, um, I think it was Friday, third Friday, someone put an uh, invitation in our mastermind group saying, I got a ticket for the US Open. Anyone want to come? And I said, when? He said, right now. And I said, I can't make it right now. Maybe next time. Then he sent a text later. Well, how about Sunday for the finals? I said, I'm in. And uh, so then I had to go talk to my sweet, beautiful wife, Kim, and, you know, explain to her why it was essential that I go to New York <laughs> and uh, the US Open. She was great. And um, and so I took a red out here. It was uh, incredible to be there. And then t- since I'm here and have to be in Vegas on Wednesday for three podcasts, I, I decided I should stay in New York. And so he said, hey, let's go to Monday Night Football. So we're going to go see Aaron Rodgers and the Jets against Josh Allen and the Bills and so it's sort of like a sports, um, you know, uh, spectacular weekend, which is kind of incredible. But, you know, one of the things that really struck me was there were 20 something people on that group text. I was the one that said yes. And I was the one that said yes right away. And I think a lot of times in life, we always think, oh, you know, why does that person get so many opportunities? Or why does that person get the life I want? And a lot of times it's just the yes. You, you know, you just lean in, you just take the opportunity and, and, um, and by the way, it's it's funny because uh, Dave Morrow, who invited the group, he t- he put on the group. I can't believe Irwin showed up. And the other guy goes, he showed up in Copenhagen with me for a meal. Of course, he's going to show up. And then I get there, I meet all these people. I'm in the second row. I didn't know where I was going to be sitting. I'm in the I'm on the second row from the ground, and uh, and all these guys are talking about their companies, and they're talking in the billions, right? You know. And uh, I think every seat was like twenty thousand dollars or something like that, and except for mine, it was like free, but, uh, but uh, which is always the best price like in the world. <laughs> and, uh, but um, I'm meeting all these people, interacting with them, and lo and behold, the guy that's next to me, his name is Irwin. What are the chances of meeting an Irwin, right? And uh, and 
Uh, Irwin is the guy who uh, gave this other guy who invited me a hundred million dollars to invest in his company. And he financed the Dodgers. And, and so I meet this guy and um, he goes, do you want to go to the Dodgers? You know, cause I'm like one of the, you know, investors for the Dodgers. And then the other guy goes, Hey, do you want to go to the Super Bowl? I, I, I have, you know, tickets to the Super Bowl. Uh, these are strangers, complete strangers. And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is such an incredible, like, reminder that one opportunity unlocks many opportunities like one yes dominoes to an endless number of yeses i don't know what my calendar looks like but i just said super bowl awesome dodgers awesome you know you want to come back to us open next year absolutely we're here you know it's like you know if i have to say no later i'll figure it out and but i i just want to encourage you before we dive into the topics that i'm going to you know really focus on today um to to open yourself up to the yeses, you, you know, and and you know the US Open may not be like a thing for you, but it, it could be you know friendships, it could be business opportunities, it could be relationships, it could be um, you know free time or or you know just some other dream in your life. Um, just lean into the yeses in life and watch how they begin to um, create other opportunities. Because here's one of the things I know. Like I get opportunities because I have a reputation for saying yes. I have a reputation for risking. I have a reputation for adventure. I have a reputation for maximizing opportunities. And because of that, it creates more opportunities and uh, and more wonder in life. And, and so I just want to encourage you in the arena here, you know, uh, live a life of courage, live a life of adventure. And, um, and then sometimes, be the flip side, create opportunities for other people, create moments for others. We realize that you may be someone else's yes, and but you didn't invite them into your world. You didn't invite them to dinner. You didn't invite them to coffee or lunch. And so you be someone's yes and uh, in their life as well. You know, I mentioned this, I think, um, in the one of the early sessions, but um, I, I get to coach this group called the USFL, the United States Football League. I'm the mindset coach for the, the league. And they're the league right under the NFL. And so those are players that are hoping to make it to the NFL, but they've already finished college. And I think the first year, 50 of the 500 players made it to the NFL, which is pretty amazing. And um, and so Zach Woodfin, who works with the USFL, and um, he brought me in and asked me if I would work on mindset development for the uh, players. So in the first meeting, I get asked by, I think, the two sharpest people in the Zoom about overthinking. One was a quarterback, I think one was a receiver. And that was really interesting that their their number one obstacle was overthinking. And so we dealt with that in the process. And then on uh, that same, I think, Saturday, I, I had to drive up, I drove up, or Friday, to Sean McVay's house because I, I, get, I get the opportunity to coach Sean McVay, the head coach of the Rams, who won 31-13, by the way, against the Seahawks yesterday, and they were not supposed to win. So that was very, very exciting. And and sitting down with Sean, I started telling him, I said, hey, interesting thing. I was you know working with the USFL, and their number one challenge seems to be overthinking. Is that a USFL thing for players that haven't yet stepped up to the NFL? Is that like the dividing line? Or is, or is overthinking a problem in, in the NFL at the highest level? And he goes, Oh no, it's absolutely the number one issue that we deal with is overthinking. And and I, I was caught by surprise that he said, no, this is like prevalent. This is a real issue. So then I moved on and tried to focus on him. And he goes, wait, 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 wait. What did you tell him? Like, how did you tell him to solve overthinking? And and so this morning I was taking a walk through Chinatown and um uh and I started thinking about overthinking and I wanted to. I was thinking about our time together and our session together. And I felt like one of the really important conversations we could have is how to deal with overthinking. Because I find this to be the number one issue, not just with athletes, with business people. And I, I find this to be true among 20 and 30 year olds, 40 year olds and 50 year olds. I find this um, to be the real issue with, with leaders and businesses, with even communicators. You know, this past week came out to speak and she just one of her biggest challenges is overthinking. Like she starts thinking about 50 different things she could talk about and, uh, and the 50 different problems in that message, the 50 different things she could deal with. And, and it's, and she starts overthinking it. And I literally had to sit with Kim this week and going, honey, you've been doing this all your life for 40 years. You've been speaking. No, no, I haven't. They go, Kim, you have a master's in theology. 
that's not worth anything. You know, it's like, you know, and just kind of walking through going, you have both the life experience and the formal training and the life training to do this. And she's still overthinking the whole process. And I actually think her biggest challenge in communication is overthinking. And I know, you know, Aaron and I get to work really closely, and, you know, and, you know, he's a, you know, 35 year old man and he has incredible gifting and intelligence. And I would say that one of the great challenges we work through as a dad and son a lot of times is overthinking. And, and I, and with my team across the board, whether it's a mosaic in, in the space of, of, you know, uh, of faith, or if it's in the business world, the number one challenge that I see people facing is overthinking. So here's my definition of overthinking. Overthinking is the endless running of negative scenarios. Overthinking is the endless running of negative scenarios. Now, the reason overthinking is always about negative scenarios is that you're never paralyzed by overthinking about positive scenarios. You will not wake up in the morning in cold sweats because you think life is going to be too good today. You're not paralyzed at work because you think your company's going to make too much money if you're not careful. You're never <clears throat> worried about your marriage because you think, oh, wow, my husband is going to be too happy today or my wife is going to be way too happy today. My kids are going to be perfect. You never overthink parenting because you think your kids are too awesome. You only overthink based on negative scenarios. So you need to realize that overthinking is the endless running of negative scenarios. And you never move into negative scenarios. You don't wake up in the morning going, I think I'm going to think about the worst case scenario. You fall into negative scenarios. And you move into positive scenarios. You never fall into positive scenarios. You don't just accidentally start thinking about all the positive options. You either fall or slip into negative scenarios. But you have to move into positive scenarios. And this is what I think is really, really important uh, to factor in. You know that old, and it's a country song, and if I could say so, it's like one of the dumbest songs I know. But uh, it's the song, um, Jesus Take the Wheel. Oh, y'all know it. I know. It's like, <laughs> you know, even if you don't like country music, you know, Jesus Take the Wheel. That's the dumbest mental framework I've ever heard. Because if you give Jesus the wheel, no one is holding the wheel. <laughs> because he didn't come to hold the wheel. He, he created you to hold the wheel. When you're not holding the wheel, the plane will go into negative scenarios. You have to hold the wheel to fight the turbulence, to fight the gravitational pull of crashing, and you have to move toward a positive scenario. So overthinking is always about endless running of negative scenarios. So one of the things Aaron always talks to me about, always, is dad give some practical applications. All right. And I don't know why he always asks me to do that because he knows I don't. And, uh, but I'm going to try to give you some, yeah. practical, <laughs> some practical applications. All right. You know what you do? Okay. T tell me if this is you. You know you shouldn't be having negative scenarios. You know you shouldn't be in negative thinking. You know you shouldn't always be like in that, you know, in that space. And the moment you find yourself in negative scenarios, you know what you do? You get down on yourself. <laughs> you know, here I go again. Man, I'm back into my negative thinking. And so you know what you do? You go into more negative thinking. So here's the thing. Stop punishing yourself when you realize you've been in negative scenarios. What you need to do is immediately move into a positive scenario. So use a negative scenario as a trigger that moves you into a positive scenario. Oh my goodness. Mariah McManus Goss is in the frame. <laughs> she <laughs> is. <laughs> I cannot believe we have, we have the honor of Mariah's presence in the arena. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, you say hi to yeah. Say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. Good 70 people on the call. <laughs> One day we're going to get Mariah to share her wisdom in here. I just know she, it. We are. She's already committed to yes. No, I literally never. Yes, you have. That. Don't act different right now. Don't act different. Right, let's, people. let's run the positive scenarios of Mariah doing that one day. <laughs> Rather than all the negative scenarios that could possibly happen. 
All right, so here's your action point. Overthinking is always negative scenarios. So immediately move into a positive scenario. But unfortunately, that won't solve the problem, but it will at least stop the downward cycle of negative thinking. The only thing that stops overthinking, and I didn't share this before, the only thing that stops overthinking is action. All right, we'll come back to that a little bit more. All right, so negative scenarios are what you slip into, what you fall into. Positive scenarios are what you move to. Choose a positive scenario, even if it's unrealistic. So I want to start challenge you to begin, the moment you're in a negative scenario, go, all right, what's the positive scenario? What's the best thing that could happen? What's the good thing that could happen? Well, what's the minimally good thing that could happen? What's a good thing that I think might happen? You know, expand yourself and begin creating positive scenarios. And it'll begin to teach your brain to think of problem solving. Because here's the secret. Positive scenarios are the upside of problem solving. And when you begin to create positive scenarios, you actually move into problem solving, which is kind of awesome. All right, next thing that creates overthinking, and we're gonna do some question and answer here in the middle of this, and uh, is that you try to control things that are out of your control. The reason you move into overthinking is that you're thinking about something you have no control over. So of course you're gonna overthink it, you can't solve it. And so when you're overthinking, you're focusing on the things you cannot control which means you're not focusing on the things you can control. Let's say you're in a relationship and there are things in that relationship that go well and things that relationship don't go well. If you keep trying to change that other person's negative behavior, you're going to constantly be overthinking because you have no control over that person's negative behavior. But if you focus on your negative behavior or your responses to negative behavior, you actually have control. And so overthinking is accelerated and fueled by trying to control things that are out of your control. One of the things I, I had to uh, I share with one of the guys that I coach who's a really high level um, executor in life is I said, and he happened to have a faith. And he said, and I said, you're trying to be God and you're really bad at being God. And since you're spending all your energy trying to be God, you have no energy to be you. So you're the worst version of God and you're the worst version of you. So what I would encourage you to do is stop trying to be God and try to be you and send, spend all your energy being you. And you go, well, how do I know when I'm trying to be God and when I'm trying to be me, right? Here it is. When you're trying to control things out of your control, you're trying to be God. When you're controlling things that are in your control, you're being you. And so in a real like practical level, you know, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, is that I really don't have control how much innate talent I have. I wish I did, but I don't. It, it, you know, it, it, whatever is that innate talent, um, you know, I, I believe that it's given to me by God. So I'm going, that's up to God, how much innate talent I have. And, and innate intelligence. I do think that intelligence is pliable. I don't think it's fixed. But let's say that your IQ is is genetic. If, if, if intelligence is genetic, I don't have control over that. I have control over what I do with the talent I have and what I do with the intelligence I have. I may not have control of how much of either one I have. And so when I try to control that, I'm trying to control that which is outside of my control. I cannot control being taller, but I can, I can control being healthier. And a lot of us try to control being taller because we have no control over that, but we don't control being healthier when we have 100% control over that. So be really clear over what you have control over and what you do not have control over. And overthinking will shift the moment you start taking control over the things you have control over. The third thing that creates overthinking is self-doubt. The reason you're overthinking is because you do not believe you have the capacity to solve this problem. Or the solution seems too big for you. And by the way, this is where I don't know how a person does this without God. 
you know, because there are times in my life I'm like, the reason I have self doubt is I know me, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, I might be able to fool everyone else, but I can't fool me. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, I don't have what it takes. I don't have enough talent or intelligence or skill or, or whatever experience. And I know me and I, and the, the great danger of self doubt is, um, uh, sorry, uh, Michael Hyatt's uh, but the doubts uh, cat just just uh, absolutely threw me off. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, cats and self doubt they just go together. <laughs> All right, and is that so? Oftentimes, what happens is that you're filled with self doubt because you have enough internal proof that tells you I can't do this. And one of the things you have to realize is that self doubt comes when you're building your confidence on things you can't control, like your talents or your intelligence. Self-confidence comes when you're building on things you can control, like character and discipline. And so when you ever notice that some people can be arrogant or, or overconfident, and it's because they're putting their confidence on the things they cannot control. And then you have a person who achieves at the highest level and they are not arrogant at all. It's because they built it on their discipline and character. And, and by the way, the, that for me was one of the things I saw with Novak um, Adovacic and winning the U.S. Open, even in the conversations afterwards and talking about um, the resilience of his parents, not even his resilience. Uh, of coming from a war-torn country or, you know, the, the resilience of having to overcome so much and um, the sacrifices they made uh, to help him achieve. Everything he talked about was character. And everything he talked about was determination. Everything he talked about was sacrifice. Everything he talked about was discipline. And you find that the really the, the best player in the world in tennis probably has more adject humility than some of the players that are not great yet or that have not even achieved his level of greatness. And you wonder if greatness can be sustained when it's built on arrogance rather than confidence. And, and, and so one of the things that creates overthinking is self-doubt and you're, you're going to focus on self-doubt if you're, basing your success on whether you're talented enough or intelligent enough or whether the circumstances are right. You know, one of the hardest things to help people through is when success is not leveraged in their direction. When you can look at a situation and go, um, you don't have the best team. <laughs> you aren't postured to have the greatest outcome. The question is, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to love the process? Are you going to be disciplined? Are you going to have determination? Are you going to have a resilience? And because and sometimes it's not the most talented person who finishes ahead. It's the most resilient person. And you have to decide, yeah, I'm just going to be the most resilient person. And self-doubt evaporates when you have self-discipline. Your confidence is built on your internal disciplines, not on your internal talents. Everything that's intrinsic cannot give you confidence. Everything that's character-based can give you confidence. You with me? All right. Let me just dive into a couple of other things. Overthinking comes when you think your feelings are reality. Now, let me be really clear so that no one gets upset with me. Your feelings are real. Did I say that with a lot of empathy? <laughs> your feelings are real. And I want you to know, I know your feelings are real. You hear me, Jory? Your feelings are real. <laughs> you know, Jordan, you hear me? Your feelings are real. I want to acknowledge your feelings. All right. Marcos, your feelings are real. I don't want anyone to go. Everyone said my feelings aren't real. What I'm saying is your feelings are real. Your feelings are not reality. There's a difference. Your feelings are not reality. When you think your feelings are reality, you will overthink because you cannot see the problem that needs to be solved. 
And so when you see your feelings as reality, you think reality needs to conform to your feelings rather than reorient your feelings to deal with your circumstances. And it's, it's a really challenging thing because one of the assessments that I use with people that helps me get a sense of how they make decisions, I would say 95% of all the high achievers I've ever graphed um, have a massive amount of emotional weight in their decision making, but they think they're completely factual. Now, by the way, this is not a male female thing. In fact, my experience is that uh, culturally, perhaps, um, women are aware that they involve their feelings in making decisions. Men seem to be completely unaware that they're involving their feelings in making decisions. And they tend to be so off the scale with how much of their feelings they think are facts. What I would say is that women know their feelings are feelings and men think their feelings are facts. And so it's not one's fact-based and one's feeling-based. What I would say is that one thinks feelings are feelings and one thinks feelings are facts. And, and that if you know your feelings are feelings, you feel comfortable going, those are my feelings and my feelings are valid and you deal with them. The other person's going, this is not, these are not my feelings. These are the facts. <laughs> they go, wow, your facts sure do feel like feelings. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know how to address that. So here's the dynamic is that you will overthink when you're trying to solve problems that are only a reflection of your feelings because you can't even see the problem. And so you're going to, you're going to drown in the quicksand of your feelings. And one of the great challenges I have with people is that oftentimes they want me to coach them through a scenario or coach them through a circumstance, but what they actually need is to be coached through their feelings because you can't even address the issue until you've honestly dealt with your feelings about that issue. And then once you can actually process the feelings, you can actually address the issues. You're overthinking because you're confusing your feelings for reality rather than your feelings being real. And by the way, I don't know who told everyone this, but your feelings do not give you the, the right to act on them. Like somewhere there was like a generational shift that says, um, I'm being authentic. <laughs> and and so I'm like, I'm a jerk, but that's my authentic self. Or I'm angry, that's my authentic me. Or I'm going to be violent. And like some people, I want to be authentic. I, I don't want you to be authentic. I want you to fake it. Because if you want to hurt me, don't be authentic. Like if you want to you know, shoot me, do not be authentic. Right? You know, if you want to rob my house, I don't want an expression of your authentic you. I want you to fake it, pretend you're not a thief. And, uh, and, you know, I think sometimes we're, we're like so confused about what our feelings give us a right to do. Your feelings give you a right to do one thing, to feel. They do not give you the right to act. They do not give you the right to speak. And in fact, sometimes the most foolish thing you'll ever do is to speak or act informed by your feelings are you with me overthinking can be the quicksand of confusing your feelings for reality all right let me move on from this okay oh by the way when your feelings become your compass staying you end up staying in a circumstance that creates a sense of powerlessness so if your feelings remain your compass, you will actually stay in circumstances that move you toward powerlessness. Because other people do not have to conform their view of reality to your feelings. And, and you know, if I could be super personal, like I remember years ago, I had someone that um, I had to let go of a job situation. And then years later, they asked to meet. And I met with them and they were very hurt. And I processed that with them the best I could. And, and then we met a second time and, uh, and I tried to help them through and, and process them through. And then they sent me an email saying, I don't think you understand the gravity of how I feel. And I don't think you feel what I'm feeling. And, and I remember I, I sent them a note saying, <clears throat> it's not my responsibility for me to feel what you need me to feel. 
it's um, it is my responsibility to take seriously how you feel. I, 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 I choose that. I don't have to, but I choose that. And I and I choose to care about what you feel and how you feel. Uh, but I'm not going to keep meeting with you until you feel I feel what you need me to feel. <laughs> and uh, and because that's actually control. And one of the things that you'll find in life is when you're surrounded by people who are driven by their feelings, they will want to force you to conform to how they feel about things. And you have to be careful because that can be an incredibly coercive and dangerous situation. And it'll move you to massive overthinking because you can't solve the problems of someone else's feelings. And you'll try to solve the problem a hundred different ways and you'll end up nowhere. And this is why overthinking is when you're trying to control outcomes instead of choices. You overthink because you're trying to find a scenario where you can control the outcome. And the truth in life is that you do not have control over outcomes. You have control over choices. And you have to decide what are the right choices I need to make. And then and hope that the outcomes will also match your desired outcomes. But you can make right choices and still have bad outcomes. Have you figured that out? And that's one of the most painful things in life. I overthink when I'm trying to control the outcome. And when I'm trying to control the outcome, I'm avoiding the right choices. Because the right choices do not guarantee me the preferred outcome. And so in those situations, I have to finally realize, oh, I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm trying to control the outcome. And so I need to immediately move from that and go, okay, I need to choose my lever. And the lever that I have power over is not the lever over outcomes. The lever I have control over is the lever over choices. And by the way, when you work with people, you can't control how people react when you make right choices. And that's why you need to make the best choices you can. Someone asked me recently for some help in a situation. And I told him, I said, you know, you've been put in a situation where you have no good outcome. Like someone that you love is going to get hurt by something you say or do, even when you do exactly the right thing. And so you can't measure what's right by whether the outcome is perfect. You have to measure what's right by it being true and being honorable and whether it has integrity. And then you have to trust the process from there. And then just one last thing before we have some conversations. I think one of the last things that um, really causes us to move toward overthinking is what I would call avoidance. And um, avoidance is this. You know what to do. You don't want to do it. So you solve problems that don't solve the problem. Part of the reason we do or we move to our overthinking, <clears throat> it, you ever just known what to do, but you didn't want to do it? I, I mean, it wasn't that you didn't want to do the right thing. Maybe it was like it was an intersection of values. You have a, an organization or a company. Um, you're responsible for bottom line. You're responsible for the health of the company. You're responsible with making sure there is a company so that people can have jobs and families can have income. There's a lot on you. But at the same time, you have an employee that has gone past being an employee. They're just a friend. And you really love them. And they had value, but they're not adding value to the organization. Now, in fact, they're, they're actually taking value from the organization um, because they're not able to execute the level that you need the company to execute at. Man, I have been there so many times. And it's such a challenging thing because it's a conflict of values. I have responsibility for the outcome of this organization, I have a deep value for loyalty and relationship. And one of those two values is gonna feel violated by the choices I make. Anybody been there? Or you've had a conflict of values? And what I end up doing so oftentimes is I try to solve a problem that isn't the problem. <laughs> so hopefully I can cover the problem that actually is the problem. And, and one of the challenges is, let's say um, you have an employee that isn't hitting productivity, but you have all these other employees that are. 
And so you don't deal with this employee that's not hitting the expected level of productivity. So what happens is that the high producers actually lower themselves to the lowest acceptable standard. And then you get angry at the high uh, producers because they're actually not executing at the level you know they could. But it's because of this choice you made, you've actually affected the culture. And one of the challenges you'll have in life, let's say even, I mean, one of the, you know, I, I thought in a really practical way of um, like when you're a, a person who has a deep faith and you're in a marriage that is um, really painful and you have a deep conviction to not divorce, but at the same time, um, you're not even in a marriage that works anymore. And I think that I know a lot of people who are really good people who have had this conflict of values. And and so you try to solve the problem by solving problems that do not solve the problem. And I think many times what you have to do is you have to step back and, and have a really honest um, conversation with yourself and going, um, the reason I'm overthinking this, the reason I'm always thinking about this, the reason I'm drowning in overthinking is because um, I can't find a solution where all my values are protected. And so I have to make decisions based on a value intersection and go, what's the best choice I can make that produces the best result for everyone involved. And I, and I, and I wish that life was simpler, but it's not. All of us will face choices in our lives where we have an intersection of values and we have to make choices that um, in some sense damage us because we had to deal with um, us not being able to live up to our own standards, forget everyone else, to our own standards and expectations. And what I would say is that when you're overthinking and overthinking and overthinking, it's because you're not, you're trying to avoid solving the problem that needs to be solved. And so you're trying to solve problems that do not solve the problem. And it leaves you drowning in there. And as painful as it is in life, it is better to solve the problem that needs to be solved rather than to solve the problems that don't solve the problem. Man, it's true in the business space. And um, uh, I was listening to these guys yesterday going back into the other space talking about, you know, I mean, just numbers that I don't even know how to fathom at times. One guy going, yeah, I lent him a hundred million dollars. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know how that feels. And he goes, and I told him, I said, yeah, I'm borrowing it, but I don't know if I can ever pay it back. And they're like, well, you got to pay me back. And they're, they're like talking about a relationship they have in, and then, and they're talking about companies that they bought and sold and, and how, how many companies had a clear problem that could have been solved but they didn't want to address the real problems. So they solved all these other problems that didn't need to be solved, hoping that somehow solving another problem would fix this one. And sometimes in life, you drown in overthinking because you want to avoid the problem that needs to be solved. All right. I just kind of gave you an overview in the whole world of overthinking. I'm kind of curious. Anybody here, first of all, would go, man, I've struggled with overthinking in my life. That's been a challenge in my own life. Why don't you just see your hands and see if I'm seeing it. All right, so we're, we're dealing with a subject that we have to deal with. Um, and, um, and and by the way, uh, every leader struggles with overthinking. You never get to a place where you don't um, end up in this kind of struggle at some point. And you might find yourself, strangely enough, being great at making clear decisions at work, and then you're terrible when it comes to family. Or you're really good at making decisions when it comes to family, and then you're terrible when it comes to work. Or it, it, it's an odd thing, but sometimes you can overthink scenarios. For me, it's so clear. All of my overthinking is about relationships. Whenever someone I love is involved in the decision that I have to make, that I think feel like might affect them negatively, I overthink and overthink and overthink and overthink and overthink and overthink. If I'm making a financial decision, I don't usually overthink. I'm actually pretty fast. Because, you know, I don't love money. <laughs> so if I if I make more money, that's awesome. If I lose money, I'll survive. But I love people. And, and so most of my overthinking is relational. Uh, but I don't find that to always be true for everyone. Sometimes you're overthinking a business decision because you're so afraid of failing. And, and by the way, 
and going back to the um, the yes that I started with about saying yes to come to US Open, you will minimize opportunities if you try to mitigate liability. You will minimize opportunities if you try to mitigate failure. And this is why overthinking is so important. Success loves speed. And when you're overthinking, you almost guarantee yourself, not necessarily failure, but a diminished life. And so overthinking paralyzes you from stepping into the life that you're created to live. And so this is why I would encourage you, the only solution to overthinking is action. So write down what you're thinking about too much and then choose one action that will move your life forward. And you'll begin to take control over the debilitating and endless running of negative scenarios. All right, let me stop here and see if you guys have some questions. Hey guys, if you, yeah, just raise your hand in the in the, in the box and then you guys can ask yourselves. We also pulled a couple of questions from the comments, Dad, but we'll, let's start with Caleb, okay? Yeah, awesome, can you hear me? Awesome, so I was just speaking of success or success loving speed. Um, how do you not overthink opportunities? Like, how do we say yes fast to the ones that are out there for us uh, while not letting our overthinking rob us of them at the same time? Yeah, you know, one of the interesting um, sociological dynamics scale with um, everyone in this box who uh, is younger than me, which is pretty much everyone, <laughs> and uh, is that you, you're you a part of a generation with too many options. And uh, the number one reason people don't get married is that you have too many options and uh you, you know in you know 100 years from now you kind of had, had one option you know the, the farmer boy next door <laughs> it's like you know he was like your option you know uh, the, the, you know the one girl in the in the 10 student schoolhouse you know and and so you, you didn't have a lot of options and so you got married and now you have so many options that it's um it's harder to say yes because Yes means no. Yes means no to everything else that is coming that you don't know is coming. So, Caleb, the biggest challenge is to keep waiting for the better opportunity. Right? You know, the, the challenge sometimes is like, oh, wait, this looks good, but something better could come tomorrow or something better could come on Tuesday. Or, And, um, and what you, I think what you need to realize at times is that you're allowed to pivot in life. And um, so I, I say yes to the best opportunity I have today. And, and then, you know, I use that momentum because right now you may have five options, but you take one option and move into it strong. You're going to have 10 options or 15 options. You know, like two years ago, three years ago, I made a, a, an investment in a new company. It's doing pretty well. But since then, I found 20 other companies that might have been a better investment. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish I, you can't, you just hang in there and you do the best you can with that one. And then when you can, you know, uh, cash out, if you want to do something else, you can do that. And so I just try never to live with regret, having made the best decision I can in that moment. And then realize that that moment is going to create more moments and more opportunities. And so look at it and go, okay, does it match your values? Does it match your, um, your passions? And does it, you know, and um, does it match your 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 risk reward ratio? Like, um, if it's too high of a risk or too low a reward, say no. And if you go, wow, this could have a very high reward for a very low risk, then I would say more often than not, say yes. I look for the lowest risk with the highest potential result. I do not look for the highest risk anymore because I realized. Oh, I was really stupid when I was young. <laughs> and, uh, I always thought the highest risk was equivalent to the highest reward. It's not. You want to take the lowest risk with the highest potential reward. And uh, and that and, and that line goes up. If you take too low of a risk, the reward is too low and really you're not you're not creating any opportunity. I want to I don't want to take the highest risk with this low of a reward, but I want to find the right risk that has an optimal level of reward. And then I also ask myself one more thing. If it fails, will I be happy that I tried? 
And when I can say yes, then I jump in. Because if it, because even if it fails, um, I'm happy I gave it a go. That for me is exciting. Just like you know, when we created the arena, I mean, it took so much work. It's taking so much work and so much resources. And, 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 you know, it's terrifying. You know, do you, you, you open your door in your first day and if you have no one in the arena, it's just me, Aaron and Austin here having a conversation with the three of us talking about, you know, communication, leadership and character and big ideas. It, it can be terrifying. And, but uh, what, was so clear for us was um, this must happen. Someone must do this and, and, and it must be us. And, and even if we failed, it would be worth the risk. And that's what I look for in that. When you go, wow, the story of trying to create this failure success is worth our life. And that's how I mitigate that Caleb. Okay. We're going to jump to um, Carlos real quick. Um, yes, I posted a question on the chat too, um, Erwin, but what do you do when you're overthinking maybe about way too many problems? How do you prioritize? How do you pick what problem to well, try to solve? Yeah, well, I, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but we need to remember that probably the primary field overthinking is fear. Hmm. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, that that's the first thing so we're thinking about a million problems um it's the best way to not solve any so this is what i would do carlos if you're thinking of a million problems one maybe just write them down because you're going to get tired of writing down problems anyway so you know and write them down and so let's just say you're just overwhelmed you got like 40 problems just going through your brain take a whiteboard write every problem down and then create universes and go, um, oh, these five problems are all connected. These 10 problems are all connected. These um, six problems are all connected. And then um, realize, okay, I don't have 40 problems. I have five problems creating 40 different effects. Now, then you go, all right, I would ask two things. What's the most important problem to solve? Not what's the most urgent. What's the most important? The most important problem to solve is the one that actually moves you forward so that you can solve a lot of other problems. And you look for the domino, the one problem you solve that, that solves like 10 of them. Because here's the problem, is that if you're only looking at what's urgent, your external circumstances will always make the decisions for you. And so what I try to do is I try to tell myself, urgency is an illusion. Urgency just means I saw this problem too late. <laughs> and, uh, if I'd seen it early enough, it wouldn't be urgent. <laughs> and, uh, and so what I need to do is improve my field of vision so that I can see things early enough. But right now, I may have to take the urgent as a loss. I just take that loss on the chin because I'm going to focus on what's important right now. And then I would just pick two. Like we talked about this last week, just pick two problems and solve those two problems. And I, I just recently saw um, one of the like the world's most renowned thinkers. I can't remember who it was, and he said he just picks one and just picks one problem to solve. I say, you know, give yourself two, and uh, and then work from there. All right, we're gonna have. Oh, and by the way, Carlos, have Leo. Leo I say, groupthink isn't a bad thing, Carlos. When you feel overwhelmed problems, get some of your team leaders together, like the top leaders, peers, and go, hey, I'm being blinded by problems and I can't see clearly. You can get in a room with two other people and it'll move you to clarity so fast that you cannot move to alone. And so what I would say is take advantage, like, you know, grab an Aaron and grab a, a Joe, whatever, and get a cluster and go, can you guys help me filter through what really are the problems I need to face and solve? And that's when communal thinking can really help you. All right, Aaron, you had someone else. Leo. Hey, hey, Pastor Aaron. Uh, I've seen through the years, uh, you stopped many big projects that I would be very proud of doing it. And I don't know if you, if you uh, just stop the project when you have another project in, 
in a wait line or you have your filters to just stop it and don't do anything about this? You mean, do I stop? Why do I stop projects or do I stop projects? Yeah, do you... Yeah, do you do you wait for having another project to start to stop this one, or you just stop it because of what's going on? Um, it depends. There, I think that what happens many times is that I'll start a project, and that project opens up a universe that I didn't see until after the project. So I'm not really start stop, stopping a project; I'm absorbing a project. And the perfect example is. Um, we created the art of communication, which I think is one of the best communication master classes in the world. And, and then, you know, sold it for whatever, $3,000. And then we did, and then Aaron asked me to solve a problem and I came up with seven frequencies, which I guess a couple of thousand dollars. And then, and then afterwards, we were gonna build an entire network of training around the art of communication and the seven frequencies. And then out of that, we went, oh, what we really need is the arena. Now, frankly, we sat down and thought if we had had foresight, we would have started the arena first and then put the art of communication inside of it and the sound frequency inside of it. It wasn't that we made a strategic decision. I couldn't see it until we created the art of communication and then the way you guys responded and then what happened in the 10 weeks of live Q&A, it, it, it allowed me to see what needed to be created. So we weren't stopping something and starting something new. We were absorbing what we started into something new that was actually a bigger universe. And that happens over and over and over again. It's just like starting Mosaic. You know, I, I'm not stopping Mosaic and starting the arena. I, I lead Mosaic. We have a beautiful, vibrant community Mosaic. But out of Mosaic, there were so many other needs that I could not meet by simply being the pastor of Mosaic. And so then you end up with a larger universe and so then you create this new world called the arena. And, you know, and, and so what I try to do is I try to create things and then to see what world opens up out of that creation and then not limit it to what I had. A lot of people, they have an idea and it's, it's so rigid that they can't allow the idea, the idea to expand and grow and to actually inform them of a future they couldn't see before. I hope that helps, Leo. Yeah, great answer. Uh, Joseph, we're going to toss to you now. Awesome. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, let's yep. go. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Hey, so I get the privilege and opportunity to speak every now and then to students, middle schoolers, and high schoolers. And a lot of times what happens with me is I'm planning out my idea and my brain will start going, oh, I can go this way. I could go this way. I could go this way. And so it's not necessarily like negative, like I'm worried about the talk, but it's more like, oh, I've got too many ideas firing in my brain at once how do you kind of handle a little bit of that that mind explosion so to speak yeah uh just i would tell you the same thing i usually tell my wife <laughs> and uh, uh choose the idea that changes you because mm. you may have 30 ideas but i guarantee you 30 ideas aren't changing you right now yeah. And a lot of times we want to preach ideas that will change the world. <laughs> right? We want to we preach things that will change the audience. But the idea hasn't changed us. And so then the idea is thinner than it should be. So mm -hmm. I'd say out of those 30 ideas, you need to go, which is the one that's consuming me? Which is the one that's changing me? Which is the one that I have tangible, practical, palatable mm -hmm. proof that this idea actually works. And, you know, so I just, I, I did a talk on um, the singularity, I think two weeks mm -hmm. ago. And um, I've been thinking about singularities for years, maybe a decade, maybe longer. And, but you've never heard me do a talk on it. And, um, but this integration of living in multiple dimensions actually like affects the way I live my life. And when I talk to like people on our team or when I, when I see someone trapped in a moment, frankly, like when I see a person trapped in a moment of depression or a moment of discouragement or a moment of, of um, negative energy, negative space, I realize 
they're not experiencing the singularity because they're trapped in time and space. I think one of the reasons that it's really hard for a moment to overwhelm me, to like crush me or to leave me depressed or defeated is that I actually live from a transcendent space that I'm already past this moment. Like I'm not trying to get through this moment. I'm through this moment. I'm now getting to actualize that. And so you want to like, even if it's a, and the reason I choose that concept is I use big, big concepts. I mean, my concepts are probably a little bit, you know, out there, right. You know, but those big concepts are only explosive because they've actually changed me. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So use That's you good. as the filter. And yeah. then if you're going, wow, I don't know which idea, then like pick, pick on Monday. Like this week, I'm going to live out this topic like really hard. Like yeah, yeah. if, if I'm going to talk about courage this week, this week, I'm going to like live with stupid courage. You know, if I'm going to talk about like hearing God's voice this week, I'm going to move whenever I think I've heard God's voice, even if it, I feel stupid. I'm going to act on it. If this week I'm, I'm going to talk about um, intuition, I'm going to act on my intuition all week long. Like, you know, whatever you're going to speak on, take that week and live it out fully. Part of my coming to New York is that I, um, I always tell myself, if I'm going to lead leaders, I have to be more adventurous. I have to pioneer. I have to be curious. I have to be creative. I have to be insane. And, uh, and, and, and so a part of my coming is my living out what I teach you guys and fleshing it out and then watching the world open up and me being proof of concept. Joseph, preach what you are proof of content, content, uh, a concept. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Here we got one more dad. You got time for it? Yeah, let's go. Michael Dow. Hey, Pastor Erwin, how you doing? Yeah, hey, great, Michael. So I tend to say yes to a lot of things because I've discovered the power of stepping into those opportunities, but I find myself in situations sometimes where I have to choose between good things that I really love. How do you navigate those type of situations? Choosing between the good is one of the hardest things in the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because you don't get any help. You know? And, uh, you know, no one's going to tell you, no, don't do that. That's too good. <laughs> you know, and I, I think that, um, one, Michael, you're a really good human being. And just, you know, and so I, I would give you a different advice as I give other people. Like you're <laughs> like, a, to me, like you're like a true human. And I think when you're that kind of human being, God gives you permission to do what you want. Mm. And so I would say, like, when you have the choice of a lot of good, just realize, um, do the one that fills you with the most joy. Mm. And, um, you know, and I know that sounds like crazy advice, but um, I actually think that the God created us to love life. Mm. And, you know, and not everyone in the world gets to enjoy their life. A lot of people suffer. A lot of people have hardship and oppression and poverty then and, and people go well you know how can god want you to enjoy life when there's so much pain in the world that's because the world is not expressing god's desire for humanity mm. and but it doesn't mean that you solve the problem by you not enjoying life you know we, we solve the problem by helping people live a life of freedom and opportunity and creating justice and equity around the world and, um, but what I'd say to you is, you know, um, do what you love mm. and don't feel, um, that you lack permission. And, and my God, I, and now I'm like, I'm speaking to myself in some ways because, um, every time I create something new like this, I feel guilty. <laughs> like I do, I, I, I struggle with like guilt, you know, the moment someone like criticizes you or the moment someone does, you know, what's he doing or, you know, in, in fact, like two weeks ago, someone DM me, it was a woman and, and she was like, you know, you don't talk about Jesus enough. You need to make your life count. I mean, she, that's, what, you know, 
And, uh, and she was just really brutal on me. And, um, and then the last thing is like, you know, make your life count. Like I wasn't. And so I went, I looked at her Instagram. It wasn't private. And she seemed like a wonderful person, you know, which makes it worse. Right. You, you know, and um, I wasn't even someone I could hate or something like that. And, <laughs> and, um, and, 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 but I did notice in her Instagram, she never mentioned Jesus, not once ever. Hmm. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. You know, that, you know, this is a nausea and she seems like she's a wonderful person. She clearly loves Jesus because she's calling me out. And, um, you know, but she doesn't mention Jesus at all. And and in that, I, I felt like this incredible sense of guilt going, oh, man, see, I'm letting another person down. So I actually responded to her, which I said, I know I shouldn't respond, but um, uh, but I, I'm going to respond to you anyway, even though it's against my better you know, <laughs> judgment. And and I said, it's fascinating to me that people who believe in Jesus feel so much permission to condemn other people and um, and to impose their view of how they should live their life on them. And I said, you know, I have to remind myself that my life does count. And one of the things, Michael, I've discovered is that most people aren't really for you to live the life that you insanely want to live. You mm -hmm. So you need to be for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, because if you're not for you, who's going to be for you? You know, and one of the things I really love about the arena is that everyone here is for each other and everyone here is you know, committed to each other being the best version of themselves and to achieve extraordinary things. And like, I, I, I don't want to apologize in this in this community for having great dreams. And having extraordinary ambition and wanting to have massive impact on the world. And I want all of you to have that. And and yeah, you, you know, I thought, oh, I can't do I post about the US Open? Because then people are like, wait a minute, you know, who do you think you are? Like, I know who I am, but I'm on road too. You know, <laughs> and uh and uh and and it should be a celebration. Like if this world worked right, you know. Like I wasn't going, I wasn't looking around going, oh, wow, I wish I had these people's lives or how come their lives are better than mine? I mean, I was the poorest guy in the whole section, you, you know, and uh, I had a security guard sitting on the floor next to me. I got him, I got him nuts and water and, and, and uh, so he could have, you know, some, uh, and he goes, I can't believe you're doing this for me. I'm like, I, I relate to the security guard, you know, I'm like, you know, he was from Greece, got to talk to him, had a great conversation with him. And he goes, how much did your ticket cost? And I said, free. <laughs> he goes, oh, wow. You know, you're doing better than me. He had to work <laughs> sitting next to me. And, you know, the, the thing is, I can't explain my life. And, Michael, you can't explain your life. And, you know, so do the good that you love and let it fill you with joy and be unapologetic in being fully alive and don't let anyone else set a standard or measure for your life because that's when you have a life well lived. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by the way, guys, I love our time together. I look forward to it every single week. And, um, you know, I, I, I love unwrapping new conversations. I literally walked, you know, for an hour in Chinatown, just trying not to overthink overthinking, but really thinking through the conversation we're going to have today and uh, every week I want to bring to you like the fresh new thinking that I have and um, that we don't have another environment to, to pass those things on. And so be interactive, man. If you guys have questions, if you have topics you want us to engage, if you have subjects that you wish we would um, take on, let me know because uh, this, this is an open arena. We want to go for the big ideas. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode of MindShift brought to you and powered by The Arena. We're so grateful that you guys tune in each week and subscribe to the YouTube, write and review this on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And you guys can check out our Instagram at MindShiftPod on IG or at The Arena Summit on Instagram as well. Uh, check out the new website, TheArenaSummit.com if you want to find out any more information about The Arena.